Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside Mr. Martin Popoff. Yes, morning, sir. How are you? Yeah, doing good. Doing yeah, good. What, what, what's it looking like uh, in New York these days? Somewhat cloudy, but pleasant. The sun's sort of out and it's a little chilly today. We had a couple days where it was like almost 80 degrees this week and now it's kind of back down to normal. I don't know how about by you, but. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Same thing here. I got my winter tires on, so I'm all ready to roll. So <laughs> I find the whole mandatory winter tire thing so crazy, but I guess yeah. when you, have, you have worse winters than we do here. So uh, sometimes yeah. I think they should make that mandatory here, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine driving around with, you know, you have to go change tires and some people have to put chain. Remember the old days where you put chain oh, on yeah. tires? It's like <laughs> studs, right? Remember studs and tires? Yeah. Those little metal spikes. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, right? But, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, that's, maybe that's the smart thing to do. I don't know. It's funny. The thing I remember as a kid with cars more than anything, and I, I just, it just makes me laugh when I think about this growing up in trail, you know, with all the salt on the road and stuff, yeah. right? Every every conversation about everybody's cars when you were a teenager was all about the rust and the bondo and it and it and you know you got to patch this and nobody talks about rust on cars anymore, right? No, no. I mean, it does happen, but not like it used to. I I remember there, we used to call them rust buckets here in New York. Yeah, exactly. And how many used to see cars everywhere that would just fall apart with rust and just like yeah, yeah. because. But again, remember too, people kept cars a lot longer back in the old days. Yeah. Like you would have a car for like 10, 15 years without question. You just drive it till it died. People like, you know, car every, every three, four years, I got to get a new car. I'm tired of this one. I'll lease another one. So cars be, have become kind of like throwaway. So maybe they don't actually get to that point where they're rusting and falling apart, I guess. Also as well, uh, you know, in the seventies and that, when the Japanese cars were just coming out, they had a notorious reputation for rusting quicker. Yeah. Right. True. Yeah. True. Plus, so much of these cars nowadays are made of plastic anyway. So it's like plastic doesn't rust. So yeah. cheaper All materials, right? right? Well, from, well from, from rust to heavy metal, let's go. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So uh, today we're going to do uh, kind of a fun show. I, I actually love this this topic because uh, I, I love the whole kind of genesis of heavy music discussion and you know in you know most cases most people when they talk about the bands that you know maybe invented or really instigated and influenced what we know as heavy music today there's four bands that always kind of come up and that's you know of course Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple and Uriah Heat the big four of British heavy rock uh, but what Martin and I want to talk about today is uh, you know there were bands that were around before them that probably even influenced those bands as well that don't get talked about as much but i think also have a lot to do with the whole creation of what we know as metal and hard rock even though you know and we're st strictly talking about the bands from the 60s right now that were creating some heavy heavy music uh but maybe don't get recognized for their importance uh towards this style of music so martin and i have each picked out five bands who got their start in the 60s. They may have continued into the 70s, but we're specifically going to be talking about their, their 70s output and why we feel they need to be mentioned in this conversation as well, alongside those big four that we just talked about. So I'll have uh, Martin take it from there and get us started here today. Okay, so yes, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, I presented actually at a couple of university conferences on this book I did called Who Invented Heavy Metal? And, uh, you know, this is very small print. Uh, this is 120,000 words. The first 160 pages of this uh, are all about the 60s. And the last 90 pages are about 1970 and 1971. So yeah, fond memories of, of going to Finland at Hels Helsinki. Do you still have any more of those left? Or is that out This of actually is still in print. It is in now in print again through Weimar. So I still have this. It's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite books. It's stuffed full of quotes about all, every little intricacy of this, of this whole question. You know, lots of 50s and pre-50s and lots of 60s. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, the, the mandate was to pick five bands each that kind of go down this road. And I've, I've got my five as um, uh, kind of, kind of like a least huge in terms of the importance uh, up to highest. So I'm going to start with the kinks and I, and I put a few, um, I put a few notes down based on why and when, because the whole point of this book is that it is a timeline with quotes uh, everything here is just laid down meticulously to the day and the month and, and like all these little building blocks. So 
August 4th, 1964 is when the Kinks release You Really Got Me. Um, and I'll just I'll just quote here, a seminal early song framed by overt use of power chords, albeit with an echo of blues patterning. Quickly, it is Dave Davies as well as Keith Richards who are popularizing fuzz applied to the guitar. So, so Keith Richards with satisfaction. Um, but Dave Davies, um, you know, the quote about, I won't go into the first part about, well, he mentioned Scotty Moore and Howling Wolf and James Burton and the Ventures, but, but the one part he mentions that's important, why this song is important. For, first of all, it's important because it is big blocks of power chords, not particularly powerful, but the idea is, you know, every time this discussion comes up, this is, this is called one of the first heavy metal songs. In this book, I actually posit that the uh, Johnny Burnett trio's version of train kept a roll and could be called the first heavy metal song back to 1953. Um, but, uh, but what he says here, uh, because the amplifiers in those days were very clean cut sounding and I wasn't very happy with that. So coupled with a variety of influences, my own sort of aggression about how I wanted a guitar to sound, I got an amplifier and I just cut the speaker with a razor blade and came out with this raunchy sound. And that was the sound I liked, which was used on You Really Got Me, which oddly has got one of my favorite guitar solos because I didn't really know what the hell I was doing at the time. So he, he says this, uh, and there's also the whole idea of um, Link Ray possibly doing this. I think his, his story is the one with you know, shoving a, a switchblade into it. There's also a story about an amp falling off the back of a truck yeah. and loosening the speaker and causing mm -hmm. distortion. So there's all these different things causing distortion along the way. And this is one of them. So August 11th, 64, they issue all day and all of the night, which is like the second sort of, um, you know, in this, in this frame of first heavy metal songs. Um, I've got in my notes in the book, it's it's built on a riff incorporating B flat and F chords, F and G, but most prominently, it's a second popular song with blocks of power chords as prime propellant power chords that in fact lead the song with vocalist, bass and drums all following and responding. So my idea here is that um, with a song like this subtly, um, I've people have asked me various times and I've got various definitions of heavy metal, but one of them is this idea that it's music where everybody crouches around the chords uh as, as if as if warming their hands around like an oil drum with a fire in it right everything is about everybody uh, paying attention there's a lot of unisonness going on right um uh, paying attention to the chords as as the prime part of the song and i think that's what you get with both of these uh and then finally october 2nd 64 the self-titled album comes out because I, what I like about the show that we're doing is that this is reaching back to the 60s, but my, my main argument often is heavy metal begins when you've got a full album that is deliberate as well. We'll get to that a little later, but you know, that's why we talk about the big four. Like this is about if the big four didn't exist, right? Um, and then, but I do, I do mention that um, the American version has an altered track list and it's called is called You Really Got Me. That song is so crucial to heavy metal history is included on both versions. Little else rises above weak T Beatles on the record other than brief stoogy instrumental revenge. Follow-up kind of kinks adds nothing to the tale. So the idea is kinks is not a heavy metal band. It was just like these couple of tunes that everybody brings up as the as the origins of heavy metal. So I'll leave it there. That's my first one, the kinks. Plus there's the whole mystery surrounding statements that Jimmy Page has made, right? With that he yes. was there during the recordings of these and he contributed some guitar work to these particular songs and of course you know dave has gone back and say well that wasn't the case so yeah and, and let, let, let me let me I, i've got a quote <laughs> from that as well too here so let's see uh heavy metals premier organist john lord is cited as playing the piano on the track recorded at ibc in london although some say it's arthur greenslade providing the parts consensus straight from the recollections of shell Ta tammy tell me is that jimmy page played neither guitar or tambourine on the track but he played a bit of both on the full-length album so there you go gotcha yeah i mean it's a long time ago we we understand people probably remember things uh a little, their, yeah. their recollections are a little bit fuzzy so uh, I love your kind of intro with that pick because, again, you're talking more about songs and not specifically albums. And that kind of ties in with my first uh, choice as well. And this is a band from California, from San Diego, to be uh, exact. The band is Iron Butterfly, right? So uh, Iron Butterfly, they debut with their album called Heavy in 1968, which really isn't all that heavy at all this is basically you know kind of uh, organ guitar psychedelic 
rock and pop. It's there's really nothing heavy about this uh, this particular album. It's good for what it is, right? But it's kind of a, pr a product of its time. Uh, but then they come out with uh, a second album called In and Gata De Vida. And right right from the cover art, you know that something serious is going on here, right? So all of a sudden we're knee deep in this whole era of psychedelia. Uh, but the title track, dun, 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 this, you know, unison guitar and organ riff line, whatever you want to call it. Uh, all And it's it, the, the guitar all of a sudden has a little bit of fuzz on it. The organ is kind of fuzzy. All of a sudden it's like, wow, this is not heavy. This is heavy, right? And the song is really long. And it's got a drum solo and yada, yada, yada. Uh, the, the way the vocals are recorded, kind of weird and creepy, right? So all of a sudden it's like, this is goes a little bit beyond psychedelia. It goes beyond pop. This all of a sudden is like, hmm, that's kind of heavy. I mean, how many bands in the wake of Iron Butterfly wanted to kind of get that kind of heavy, ominous guitar and even with organ, right? A lot of bands that did the guitar and organ thing that came after this. Uh, the album itself, though, not really heavy. Uh, most anything you want has some, again, some fuzz on the guitars. The organ is kind of saturated. The, the vocals, not really all that far removed from pop. Are You Happy is another one on here. Uh, so again, this, is more, this band is more about certain songs have that kind of early heaviness. And again, it's... Uh, it, there's a lot of bands experimenting with using effects pedals on, you know, for guitars as well as for keyboards. And all of a sudden you have things like Wawa pedals and fuzz pedals and overdrive and things like that, where you're adding gain to the instruments. And that's giving this kind of, you know, heavy sound where you're taking what is essentially kind of like a band from the flower power era. Cause a lot of those songs kind of fall in line with that. And all of a sudden now with these overdriven sounds, it's, turning into something else uh they kind of went a little further with some stuff on their next album ball which has a similar sound lots of creepy vibes loads of organ occasional heavy guitar like in the time of our lives uh more like this is more like psychedelic rock but uh the one specifically the one song kind of puts them into this category in this discussion and like i said they influenced a ton of other bands uh after this even though overall would you really call iron butterfly that heavy of a band maybe not maybe not but like with the kinks they certainly had some songs that kind of fall into that category and just add to their you know influential status yeah interesting yeah um and and it's cool having you know the uh the name of the album heavy that's a whole nother discussion the origins of the term heavy metal which is really complicated and and nuanced there's a there's a humble pie review there's an electric flag review there's lester bangs metal mike saunders stephen wolf heavy metal thunder naked lunch but you've got heavy there and you've even got the name of the band is like a heavy metal band, Iron Butterfly. Butterfly, right? yeah, like, exactly. You, know, you got Budgie and you got Led Zeppelin and <laughs> you know all all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and and that song specifically as well, um, you know, a heavy metal touchstone from you know let's let's give it away. Everybody knows, but the album that invented heavy metal in a big big way, the first Black Sabbath album. So you've got you've got Diablos in Musica, the Devil's Tritone, right? You know the as as Tony says it in in just his uh, you know. In, in his his plane speak, he said, he says, well, how did we invent heavy metal? Like, I remember him just saying this to me, like sitting in an interview in person. He goes, instead of going from here to here, we just went from here to here. Right. Three so notes. so Three notes. that's it. That's <laughs> it right there. Right. The, the, the devil's tritone. Um, um, and I have a quote about uh, Iron Butterfly here from from the book as well. So Ball is January 17th, 69. So already so we're still in the 60s. Yeah. Iron Butterfly issued their third album, Ball. And by this point, the band have quite a few considerably doomy songs that had they all been on the same record and had they been recorded with louder guitar, Iron Butterfly would would have had a record as imposing as Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath, although Ball is the lightest Iron Butterfly yet reversing trajectory. This is much the same argument that could be made concerning Led Zeppelin, that an amalgamation of the band's heavy material from Led Zeppelin and two, we are only having this discussion because both were issued before Black Sabbath. 
would have made one record nearly as heavy as Black Sabbath's debut, although not as doomy and not as forward thinking or visionary in a word weaker. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. You know, you take some of the all the best off those first three Iron Butterfly albums and you all, you all of a sudden you have a pretty heavy album. And, you know, maybe if they change up the, the vocal styles a little bit, because some of the vocals are really kind of like happy and just, you know, like very, very 60s psychedelic flower power yeah. type of thing. But uh, yeah, that, that's a really good point, because th there are kind of like with the kinks, you have like this handful of these handful of songs across a bunch of albums in the uh, mid 60s. Iron Butterfly, too. You, you take a look at those first three albums albums and cherry pick like two or three from each you've got, you've got a pretty hard hitting album right there yeah cool all right so my second choice um jimmy hendrix so so this is this is one that i really lean to as one of the key key pre-70s ones and and it is on this on the basis of a handful of songs so again i made a few notes from the book because it's all about dates you know for me in the in the milestone trajectory right september 24th 66 manager Chaz Chandler and his new charge Jimi Hendrix arrive in London Jimmy with no more than the clothes on his back and a present for Great Britain in the form of heavy metal uh, October 5th so just uh, two weeks later the Jimi Hendrix experience is born when Jimmy Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell play together for the first time this is this is five days after Jimmy appears live for the first time in the UK jumping on stage with cream at London Polytechnic December 16th 66 Jimi Hendrix version of Hey Joe is issued in the UK. That's not the important part. Um, blah, blah, blah. Not a factor in the invention of heavy metal. The song nonetheless becomes one of Deep Purple's earliest jams. Blah, blah, blah. More significant is the B-side to the single, Stone Free, which features a fairly driving and heavy pre-chorus and chorus plus a 4-4 beat clanged with cowbell. As well, Jimmy's guitar solo is very heavy metal for 1966. Of note, Jimmy's full... Okay, um, skip that. Um, so January 11th, 67... Uh, Jimmy signs with the Who's Track Records and records most of Purple Haze. So he's recording Purple Haze, super important song. Yeah. Um, a significant moment on one level, heavy metal could be said to have been invented, at least at the song level, invented here uh, or not. Purple Haze is a first level milestone in the story. March 17th, 67, Purple Haze comes out as a single. So spring of 67. Um, let's see. Uh, so Mark difference advancement has occurred from the fuzzy garage rock that has come before. And indeed many of the tropes of histrionic heavy metal guitar are on display right here. Like that whole intro is, is truly heavy metal. The arrangement, it's a power trio song. Um, it's got, you know, excuse me while I, while I touch this guy, ding, 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 you know, so it's got some really cool new things that aren't particularly based on the blues. It's not much of a blues song. Um, what else do I say? So at a higher threshold, which we must necessarily rise to as we advance through the years, Purple Haze can be posited as one version of ground zero for the invention of heavy metal, at least within the language of single song. Ironically, one could also say the song competes with only one of two earlier experience tracks, one is Stone Free, issued three months earlier, lighter yet still quite rocky bit again. Additionally, uh, additional B-side to Purple Haze 51st anniversary is in possession of a hard rock written structure, but the lack of bite in the guitar and the meekness of the recording lessens its, its impact on the story. And so we know as we go through the albums, we also get the first guitar hero. Um, this guy's a massive influence on heavy metal. You know, there's only a few albums. They aren't heavy metal albums, but there's there's definitely songs here and there uh that that you know contribute to the heavy metal story in a big way yeah i mean the impact of this guy and this band cannot be understated at all and uh you could pick out tons of tracks i was just thinking in my mind you know spanish castle magic and machine gun and voodoo child i mean there's plenty of heavy metal tropes and all those songs and again we have to go back to uh, like some of the equipment that he was using, right. And some of the effects and things, because he was utilizing, you know, he, he's probably the guy and other, and we'll talk about other guys who also use things like fuzz boxes and whatnot, but uh, you know, had effects created for him and created some of his own that to add fuzz and, and uh, you know, the, the wah, wah pedal, he's the guy who the signature, you know, guy who really, really made that and took that to the stratosphere utilizing uh, the, a whammy bar, right. To make all these, kind of weird sounds i mean every heavy metal band has done that afterwards um utilizing feedback and just exactly big volume. innovator on feedback as is ted nugent <clears throat> ted nugent is a big part of this early feedback story as well right right exactly yep with the with the dukes yep um so i mean you know hendrix was 
not only writing songs that could contain all of this and present it in a way that was actually really heavy, but uh, a, a true innovator as far as, you know, guitar uh, technology and guitar equipment and amplifiers and all that sort of thing. So, and that, uh, you know, where would heavy music be without all these things that Hendrix was doing back, you know, in the mid late sixties. So yeah, it's a, it's a great, great pick. And maybe Manic Depression is the first progressive metal song, right? Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. I mean, the drums on that, right? I mean, you know, Mitch Mitchell was doing some insane stuff on the drums back then. Very, very underrated player. Yeah. And the whole power trio thing, right? I mean, how many hard rock and heavy metal power trios have we had over the years, right? It's, it's Hendrix, arguably the, the first, you know, them are cream, right? Those are the, the first big ones. So, yeah. Very cool. All right. So my next choice is a, uh, a U.S. and Canadian band. Martin, Martin mentioned them before. The band is Steppenwolf. Uh, not an overall, you know, I wouldn't call a lot of their music that that heavy, but uh, for one song for sure, Born to be Wild, right, yep. contains the lyric, I like smoke and lightning, heavy metal thunder, right? could be talking about motorcycles, could be talking about the music, uh, but really the first time that those actual words together were used. Um, yeah, this this band, I think, uh, kind of had the heavy metal look. Their look was heavy. You know, they kind of came across, they had this dark kind of biker look to them. You know, John Kay was a great front man. He wore the sunglasses, the long hair, the leather jackets. You know, he had that kind of tough guy persona. Some of this stuff was was very guitar driven and, and kind of riff driven. You know, you got Sookie Sookie off the first album. So they, they debuted back in 1968. So you got the first album and uh, Steppenwolf the second. Uh, the Pusher is kind of a heavy rocking song. You got Magic Carpet Ride, of course, Born to Be Wild, like I mentioned before which has been probably remade more times than any uh, hard rock song in the history uh draft resistor monster suicide um you got uh, for ladies only pretty rocking track and i and then uh, of course you know the the monster album which again is a great title for an album right and even though like i said this is not black sabbath heavy uh this is just energetic early biker music there's this there's an aura of psychedelia here as well there's a little bit of blues uh but they take that you know again this is not a band that was doing like iron butterfly or maybe vanilla fudge not all these keyboards this is basically a two guitar band uh you know playing garagey biker rock uh with a, a little bit of a pop sensibility there you know a, a song like magic carpet ride kind of riff driven but more of like a funky pop song at its core you know but uh yeah really really important band um again maybe not as heavy as a lot of the bands i'm going to talk about but still it's a hard rock band and they captured the attention of the public and uh, again pretty early on and plus there's the whole born to be wild heavy metal thunder tagline there so yeah, and, and one of the nuanced things uh, that people don't talk about a lot in that long history of the term heavy metal and when it was used first and by who, was it Lester Bangs in Rolling Stone? Was it Metal Mike Saunders in Cream? You know, because, because uh, you know, the, the early uh, uh, uses of it were applied to like Electric Flag, which wasn't heavy, a Humble Pie album that wasn't very heavy. And then people break up heavy versus the use of metal and then and then, you know, it's tied in with that naked lunch thing. But the thing people don't talk about a lot is that subconsciously hearing John Kay say heavy metal thunder on a on a true modern heavy metal song for its day. I think that seeped into um, the reason that term, uh, you know, all the all these little abstract disparate reasons that's one of the big ones that i think it became a, a term that got applied and i just i i did pull one quote about steppenwolf from the book so october 68 steppenwolf it issued their second album called the second again the record is the work of a band rarely thinking of heavy sounds but opening faster than the speed of light is an interesting addition to our story being a modern heavy metal but less so of the complex british variety more proto towards the simple party metal sound of kiss and ted nugent as well magic carpet ride from this record was a huge hit although it's pure toe tapping pop rock its opening squall of guitars is egregiously heavy and it's a few seconds of glorious wattage that has been mainlined into pop culture continuously through radio since the day it came out also there's a long brisk jam that is quite proto purple even if the rhythm guitars are weak point is the music uh the music layman thinks steppenwolf is heavy because of born to be wild the bits of this hit plus one supposes john's voice and all these harrowing songs about drugs and war and hippie life so there's there's a real uh black sabbath 
sort of lyrical feel to it as well. And you're right. They look so badass too. They right? totally do. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> the package, the package is there. They've got like 10 to 15% in every department, Yeah. you know, uh, but, but that's it. 10 to 15%. Right. So. Yeah. And, and one thing too, that uh, we probably should mention that I think all the bands that we're talking about today really, really made a name for themselves on the live circuit. And I think a lot of, you know, again, we're talking about the era of live albums here. So a lot of them have like these amazing live albums where the bands sound even heavier on stage than they do on in the studio versions of some of these songs. I think that played a big part in it as well. Yeah. Okay. So as I move up to my top three, I actually do move into the realm of albums. And I, that's the thing I've always said. An album is the most important thing to represent, but I don't feel any of these three are the one because, um, well, various reasons as, as I'll bring up, but my next one is the Stooges. So there's the debut album, August 69. Okay. So summer of 69. And there's the second album, Fun House, and we're already up to 1970, July of 1970. This is not an important album in the birth of heavy metal. And as we know, punk also claims the Stooges as well, right? Um, but um, so so the debut, though, this is this is quite a well-recorded album. To me, to me, it's almost like Van Halen 1 to Van Halen 2, because the second Stooges is much scrappier than the first Stooges. This is the one where they it's kind of put together, it's, it's recorded, it's produced by John Cale. It's, a, it's a basically a pretty good sounding album for 1969, but it's full of basically heavy metal riffs. I mean, I want to be your dog, uh, 1969, no fun, real cool time, and not right, little doll. Most of side two of this is is pretty pretty much proto heavy metal but but the reason you know black sabbath wins is because this is still uh garagey detroit rock it's it's definitely got a link to a slight link to psych a slight link to garage not really a link to the 50s but it doesn't have any it has a little bit of Diablos in Musica to it, but it's it's definitely not evil like Black Sabbath, you know, start to finish sort of thing. Um, so that is 69. Let's see, what do, what do I say here? Uh, once again, moving through time, expectations, what can, can constitute heaviness, necessarily intensifying the bars raised. If we can agree that we want to discount the first, well, let's, let's not get into that because uh, those are my next choices. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, Validity, a sense of clue that the metal from these bands is from a whole different philosophical tradition, which can be tapped and examined to inform us why sonically and structurally these Detroit bands are fundamentally different from Black Sabbath, Deep Purple in Your Eye Heap. So, so again, it, it's, you know, all of those are of a set with the, with the evilness, with the classicalness, with, uh, with the epicness, the, the regal, the Teutonicness even. Those are all of a set, not Led Zeppelin, but definitely Heap, Sabbath, and Purple. And Stooges, you know, isn't quite there. But this, you know, this this is a pretty pretty darn modern heavy metal album for uh, for 1969. What what did I say here? Uh, so is it October? Hang on, what's what's the date on that again? So uh, yeah, August 69. So we're in the summer of 69 here. So so Sabbath is February 1970. Sabbath already exists at this point. But, uh, you know, the album's still uh, a few months away. Plus a wealth of guitar solos on that debut Stooges album. A lot, right? That's yeah. also something of the time, right? These, these bands that just just go for it. And like, you know, we have a three, two and a half, three, three, maybe four minute song. And we've got 40 seconds taken up by guitar solos. Why not, right? And that's yeah. something some of these bands did as well. All right, so my last of the kind of picks where bands have kind of heavy songs before we I get into my kind of albums, you know, bands where we're, we're putting out albums full of kind of maybe heavy stuff, um, is The Who. Okay, so as early as 1965, you know, this band was using on certain songs, you know, loud overdriven amps, you know, feedback, power chords and things like that so my generation of course is one of those i mean this was a pretty brash you know energetic song for the time you even have a bass solo in it that's got a that's overdriven right uh can explain using you know power chords and whatnot i can see for miles a little bit of feedback going on there uh this this loud frantic riffing on songs like happy jack Right. And uh, so you've got, you know, these early albums, which are, you know, again, 
these are uh, full records, but the band most notably known for singles. Okay, and the band starting to do some things live on stage, you know, destroying equipment, right? Pete just smashing his guitars, things like that. Normal bands didn't do that at the time, right? Uh, and then the band gets a little bit artsy on, you know, Tommy, obviously, you know, the first rock, full rock opera. There's some rock and stuff on here. Pete using some power chords on here. But for the most part, this is just a very lush, kind of very progressive minded album. But I think where the band really kind of took the turn uh, into being one of the unsung heavy bands is when they released uh, Live at Leeds, which all of a sudden takes these songs that we thought, OK, that's kind of rock and stuff. And all of a sudden, live on stage, these four guys with lots and lots and lots of volume and all of a sudden it's like wow this is this is heavy you know for the first time we're really thinking of the who is as a really heavy band by this point in time also roger daltrey has grown his hair out he's on stage wearing the the mesh vest with the bare chest and he's twirling the microphone and i mean this is heavy metal you know vocalist 101 right all these moves that he's doing the way he looks everything like that you got pete is using you know just lots and lots of volume you got moon just playing just all over the place you've got uh entwistle is also really loud in the mix so all of a sudden you know this kind of really artsy band on tommy is this gargantuan giant heavy rock band based on what they were doing live on stage and you know i think for me the who a lot of their albums, their studio albums are a little safer, but when you listen to them, uh, especially if you, know, if you watch footage or listen to live albums from back in the day, a totally different beast when they were out on tour, which I think a lot of these bands kind of were. So uh, I, I think you have to include them here for the early, like the kinks, the, the power chord riffing, the use of you know fuzz and distortion, uh, and then the whole image and just sheer sonic output of them when they would go out and play these legendary uh tours and shows so the who yeah excellent and <clears throat> and you you definitely have probably the prototypical first heavy metal drummer you mentioned john entwistle with the distortion on the bass and a bassist playing busy um you've got uh you know there's a whole there's a whole story in here from my i think i can't, can't remember the guy's name but um you know, the roadie who was with them the whole time, like he, he talks about the very birth of the Marshall stack, right? The yeah. idea of, of, you know, wanting to stack two of them up. They weren't being heard. It was, it was taking Pete off. You've got the destruction going on as well. So yeah, again, all these little bits and pieces and you're right. It all, it all culminates in that, in that live album. Yeah. And, you know, Pete went from early on using like uh Rickenbacker guitars you know, with single coil pickups and playing a lot of that shimmering stuff early on to going switching to Gibson SGs, you know, with humbuckers and that just on top of everything else, just, yeah, took it to, yeah. to the next level. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. So my next one, um, which I always cite as a, as a major influence is MC5, uh, specifically with kick out the jams, you know, there's, there's the guys, Looking, looking basically like a heavy metal band. Yeah. You know, you, you can't let, you can't look uh, much uh, more heavy metal than that. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, October 66, they're already, they're already well in operation. Um, let's see. Uh, so they, they play the show. They play the shows at the Grandy that, that are going to be making up this album. Uh, October 30th, 31st. 68 so it's a halloween 68 thing and the album comes out into 69 what is the date here again february 69 so a full year before uh black sabbath black sabbath and this album start to finish i mean it it cheats because it's a live album right um just like the who um but you know you think of the song kick out the jam straight modern heavy metal song um Rocket Reducer, number 62, Ramalama, Fa, Fa, Fa. Borderline is pretty heavy metal. Um, Motor City's Burning, I Want You Right Now, big clang and open chords. Starship is, is again, quite modern heavy metal. So start to finish, this is a really aggressive, it, it really actually, it's, it's a nice follow-up, you know, segue from the Who Live at Leeds, right? Um, but yeah, really heavy album. But it is their heaviest album because already into 1970, this is not a particularly heavy album. And then into 71, this actually does have some pretty heavy stuff on it. 
But when you're into 71, as as I had in this book, you know, I, I went one extra year uh, almost just to to make the point that Black Sabbath is the winner because, you know, you fall down on Master of Reality when Deep Purple's doing uh, Fireball and and Heap, you know, Heap's still pretty heavy as well. But but Master of Reality, just just like it is the heaviest of all those heavy albums. So, you know, I discount all these bands really don't matter by that point in this story of heavy metal because they've been so surpassed by what is happening with the British bands. And, and that's it. So MC5 just had the three albums. Um, but yeah, when you when you want to start talking about first heavy metal albums and we have these Facebook wars about this whole thing, um, Kick Out the Jams often comes up. Yeah. yeah. It's so weird. It's their first album, right? The first album, it's a live album. It's their heaviest album. And uh, yeah, yeah. imagine how, how history would be different if they kind of followed that up with something equally as banging. Because those those two, the two successive albums that came afterwards, yeah, they're okay. But the, the first album, yeah, that's the shit right there. Yeah. All right. I, I, let's stay in uh, Michigan, shall we? Uh, for another power trio band who kind of like the mc5 started off a bit heavier and then got a little lighter along the way they added a fourth member and got great producers and had lots of hit singles but early on uh grand funk railroad from flint michigan uh a power trio basically another loud garage band from michigan uh incorporating loud brash rock and roll with funk blues and soul music i mean that was kind of their shtick um and again early on you know other than like you know maybe i'm your captain right uh not really a singles band more of an album band here and these albums were fairly lengthy for the time uh songs you know four or five minutes long no like little three minute ditties in this catalog uh you had mark farner had the heavy metal look. I mean, he was like your prototypical frontman guy, guitar player, long blonde hair, bare chested all the time without a shirt. Um, and he looked the part. Uh, you had this great heavy rhythm section, right? Their live shows were furious, loud, sweaty, drove the kids crazy. Critics hated them. I mean, this is like, you know, heavy metal story 101 right here. Um, and, right? Because like, you know, the, the, after bands like this, it's like the critics like, ah, heavy metal band. We don't like them, right? We're going to shit on them. But, you know, albums like, you know, On Time, Grand Funk, uh, certainly the live album, Closer to Home. I mean, these were their all their 60s into 1970, uh, utilizing fuzz and feedback and other effects that, you know, a lot of other bands were using at the time. Um, you know, songs like Are You Ready, Paranoid with, with all that fuzz and distortion at the beginning of the song on the main riff, Into the Sun. Again, these are a lot of very frantic, riffy tracks, Inside Looking Out, taking that old animal song and totally turning it into a hard rock classic. Uh, In Need, Got This Thing on the Move, Sin's a Good Man's Brother. Uh, you know, a lot of these songs that were like remade by and, and redone by bands many, many, many years later who look, you know, back to Grand Funk Railroad as an inspiration. Uh, just, you know, big bold frantic riffing um heavy heavy bass i mean mel's bass is just completely kind of like ent whistles uh big and bulbous and full of fuzz and whatnot and the drums are crashing you know maybe it's kind of like dinosaur rock right because the music is fairly simple but i think that's the whole thing i mean how many other metal bands have we had over the years that just specialized in simple you know hard rock and heavy metal music right nothing too complicated no no big fancy uh intricate riffs or anything like that just kind of like meat and potatoes rock that's kind of grand funk railroad but you throw the little funk and soul and r&b element into it uh, i think made them a pretty pretty unique band but uh, you know there's no denying that the early early 60s albums are, are probably their heaviest um and yeah i i've always included them in this conversation so grand funk railroad and again a lot lots of the bits and pieces the the visual everything about them even the name of the band right so yeah. Yeah, good choice. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, I did have a bit of a, a quote about the MC5 here. Um, an analysis of the record yields solidly heavy metal tracks and kick out the jams, come together, rock and reducer, borderline. Also, I want you right now is heavy ish and camp opener. Ramblin' Rose is old time rock and roll, hugely heavied up, almost made fun of. That leaves a mere two tracks. The one with the heaviest title, Motor City is Burning, is ironically a boring slow blues, and Closer Starship is an acid soaked art rock noise collage, essentially a non track in the way an acoustic song would be, namely, it doesn't and add or detract from heavy metal intention in one respect starship is so nightmarish and squalled with distorted guitar noise that it is closer to heavy metal experience than not um 
but uh but yeah so uh so number my last choice is again a down this album road just like the mc5 blue cheer um now blue cheer is the is the one band uh is the one band with the one album that that gets mentioned the most uh pre-1970 with vincibus eruptum um so a few notes again they're formed in 66 you know they're up north davis davis ca managed by an ex-hell's angel named gut um uh, they become just a trio, not just a trio, but a power trio in 67. The etymology of the band's name derives in part from the catchphrase stay clean and also a name for a type of acid. Um, but uh, yeah, I found this interesting. So Dickie told me this. I, I interviewed Paul and Dickie, uh, you know, before they died a couple of times. Um, and he says another part of it is that we were all into the blues, but we weren't into just being sad. And actually in the blues medium, they had a name for this. It's called jump blues and the album title Vince Bus eruption that came out of a friend of ours by the name of Richard uh, Petticord, um, who showed up one day at a commune with a big piece of butcher paper on it and put it on the kitchen wall. And we all looked at it for quite a while and didn't say anything. And finally said, Richard, what's this? And he said, this is the name of your new album. This is what you should call it. Vince Bus eruptum, meaning we control chaos. And we said, yeah, that's cool. That's great. Um, so January 68, very early a big heavy album for 1968 but but i often sort of denigrated and put it down a little because to me it's almost like it cheats a little bit in that it's somewhat like a live album but it's a studio album um and it's also got covers not got a lot of songs it's definitely got a chunk of blues it's got a chunk of garage so so when i'm always like plumping for black sabbath as being the first one or heap one or deep purple in rock you know it it's all i always go back to this that blue cheer album almost came out that way by accident in a way by by way of the drugs and the amplification but it's but it's but it's rooted in old things and it sounds kind of oldie but um what I always like is the fact, and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll read this. So so August sixty eight. So just kind of like Zeppelin putting out two albums in sixty nine. Blue Cheer is putting out two pretty heavy albums in sixty eight. So they they deserve recognition, but too much of the recognition goes to the first one and not to Outside Inside. So what I say about that is. Outside Inside is released, becoming a cogent candidate for first heavy metal album, given both the heaviness and riffiness of the songs Just a Little Bit, Gypsy Ball, Come and Get It, Magnolia, Caboose Finger, and Babylon. Even Feathers from Your Tree and Sun Cycle contain loud, heavy parts, not to mention manic drumming and fairly aggressive vocals out of Dickie, both elements also a part of the band's speed metal version of the Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. All that is left is a cover of hard rock blues, Rocker the Hunter, which almost surprisingly at this point stays in a garage rock zone albeit again cantankerous dangerous and loud but uh, but alas dated um you know and um jack uh jack and dino actually calls this like one of his favorite albums of all time he's a he's a big supporter of this album so yeah the second one is almost even a better candidate than the first one for first heavy metal album so this is lay stevens dicky peterson paul whaley and i brought up my randy holden population too because there's some Great fascinating album. stuff yeah. yeah and and i've interviewed him and he says some really interesting things about the birth of metal and uh because he comes into blue cheer now after after these two albums and um but he has all these weird quotes about kind of like a mental illness thing about how he was he could picture sounds in his head and you know it's all about amplification and and th there's this weird you know if if this wasn't so underground and the funny thing about this is he uh, he really doesn't even realize or or understand when it when he made it exactly if it officially came out or if it was just a bootleg at the time and all this, cause it's, it's 69 bleeding into 1970, which again is important because in this book, it's all about the timeline. Right. Um, but yeah, so, so sadly he's not Lay Stevens. He's not the guy on the first two. Um, but, but yeah, this, this album is, is a legendary album. Like, like you say, I mean, it's, it's very well known in, in hard rock, heavy metal circles, but it's, it's pretty casual and, you know, uh, and noisy and almost live as well. Uh, sort of thing but yeah po population two is kind of one of these you know there's another five or six albums of these one album situations that fit in this 69 into 70 time frame but uh black sabbath makes it all irrelevant uh right. essentially right. on friday the 13th in in february right in february, right. February, right 1970 so there you go blue chair two records 
as we move right into like like the actual full album zone. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, that second Blue Cheer album is quite possibly stronger start to finish than Vince and this erupted. And I think it's got better songwriting. You know, Vince, Vince of this, the, the debut is notorious. And I think it, it, it gets included here by default because of the, you know, overuse of volume and distortion. Because, yeah, there's lots of covers on there. And if you take away all that, is it that remarkable of an album? I don't yeah. know. But the second album is really, really strong. And then the whole Randy Holden thing is interesting because he comes and joins the band as the band completely moves away from any heavy and loud music at all. Yeah. And his solo album there is actually way heavier than all of the most rocking moments on the next like four uh, Blue Cheer albums combined. Because exactly. yeah. they're not heavy at all. They're, they've, yeah. You listen to those albums, they're like right. a completely different band. They're fine for what they are, but that's not heavy at all, at all. Yeah. So that's a great choice. All right, my final pick here today, uh, we're going to go back to Great Britain, uh, another power trio. You have to talk about this band in this uh, conversation. The band is Cream. All right, Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce, and Eric Clapton, who all came out of the British blues scene, various, uh, you know, Alexis Corner and John Mayall and whatnot. Um, a band that I think out of all the bands that we're talking about today firmly rooted in the blues and here's where a band kind of like what led zeppelin did where they take the blues and add like volume and other elements to create this you know fairly heavy music i mean this comes out in 1966 so we're going back a ways and this band was only around for a brief couple of years um you know adding fuzz adding improvisation, right? Whereas, you know, most classic blues songs are short and whatnot here. Let's take the blues framework, let's add volume and fuzz and let's jam and solo for an endless amount of time. Uh, you know, and even more so live, but you've got tracks like, uh, you know, Sweet Wine, Spoonful, NSU, I Feel Free, you know, I'm So Glad. The second album, of course, has one of the great early riff songs of all time in Sunshine of Your Love. I mean, such an influential song there. You've got Clapton, again, utilizing a little bit of fuzz. Uh, you've got uh, White Room on the subsequent album that's utilizing, you know, what the wah-wah pedal, making it the feature sound of the song. Uh, you've got other songs like, you know, Tales of Brave Ulysses and Strange Brew, where they're, they're adding some extra things on top of the traditional blues sound to give it this kind of bite and give it this heft and then of course you know the live albums they'll take any of these songs and they'll stretch them out to 10 15 minutes and you've got loads of battling guitar and bass and drum solos and you got the, you know three characters here in this band all you know ginger baker you know kind of the nuts guy of the band you've got uh, bruce and Clapton always kind of seemed to be fighting for supremacy within the band, both both singing. Uh, but again, their their lights, you know, shine very, very, very quickly. And by the time we've got to the end of the 60s, the band is no more. They say goodbye. Some good stuff on here as well. But uh, definitely, you know, if, if overall you look at all of their material, all of their albums, none of them are overly heavy start to finish. But you do have these kind of heavy blues tracks because this was more of like a, a heavy blues band, I think, that had like the improvisational skills of jazz guys. Right. So uh, but they have to be included here. And, uh, you know, also one of the early great heavy bands. Yeah. And, and part of the narrative that ties them to this is also um, people always talk about them and, the uh, you know, associated with the the. Uh, the birth of the modern PA systems, right? Because there's all this, you know, snickering about how their egos were so big that they each had to be louder than the next guy. And that guy turns up and that guy turns up and that guy turns up, but you know, heavy metal is somewhat born when, um, when you have, uh, the instruments coming through a PA, you have a PA necessarily because the vocals need some volume. And then you start miking the drum sets at the same time. Right. So all of that and all of that adds electricity. And as soon as you add electricity, you can, you can start playing more with distortion. It could be natural distortion. It could be pedals. Um, so, um, so yeah, cream cream's pretty important with that. And then, uh, and then um, you think of sunshine of your love that you've got a little bit of Diablos in music on that. It's a little bit of an evil sound right yeah yeah and the whole bass player as lead instrument too right which we, we've seen a couple of occasions here today but uh, yeah and you know um do we get the hendrix experience uh 
kind of hitting their full potential if we don't have a cream because i think deep down inside i think uh hendrix was a big fan of this band and wanted to kind of outdo them because it was this competition amongst all of them at the time so yeah. i think uh cream was very important i think in the development of the experience as well yeah well i never thought about that and and the and the who competing with the, with them all at the same time as well right, right? Yeah. So yeah. Drive, who can be, who can be louder than the next, right? Could you imagine like yeah. like a, a bill of all three of those bands? Who's gonna follow who, right? And uh yeah. kind of crazy to think about it. Yeah. Like any anybody would walk out of a concert seeing the three of those back to back to back probably would be deaf. You yeah. know, it's crazy. Cool. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, a little walk through some of the uh, early heavy bands of the 60s before those big four kind of came into prominence. And uh fascinating discussion i love talking about this kind of stuff what yeah. do you think martin is the 70s going to be calling us well you know an, an interesting way to talk about the 70s or an interesting topic i i like is the whole idea of um what was the american response to the to the uk bands right so that might be an interesting one. We can talk about that that 1970 to 1973 situation. What was happening in America? So we can hash that out. See if we can come up with sounds good. Five each, sounds maybe good. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So Martin, uh, give us an update on uh, books and the podcast and the Contrarians. What you got cooking on your end? Yeah, the books are all martinpopoff.com, and I've got the audio podcast history and. Five songs, one new one every week. I'm up to about 173 of those. And then Contrarians, we've got regular shows going up all the time. So, yeah, lots going on. Cool. Cool. Coming up here on the channel tomorrow, we've got uh, the UK connection with myself, Simon and Stephen. Uh, we're going to be doing another ranking the songs on a classic album. Tomorrow is Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell. And then uh, stay tuned on Sunday. I will be ranking the albums of High on Fire. And then uh, we kick off the work week Monday. No Hudson Valley Square is coming up on Monday because it is Halloween, but I'll be doing a live Q&A show at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So stay tuned for that. And then, of course, uh, Tuesdays in the prog seat and we continue the week from there. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. This is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn time. For Martin Popoff, I am Pete Parter. We'll see you next Friday here at the Funhouse. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care. <laughs>